uh, associate professor Pooling Gong, who uh, is across the hallway from me. Um, he does a lot of incredible research. Um, he really goes after big ambitious ideas and tries to go up to kind of big theories of uh, how the brain works and has recently been interested in uh, artificial neural networks and uh, always thinking in, in uh, unique and interesting ways. So it's a pleasure to have, have you here, Pauline, and look forward to hearing what, you, what you've been up to. Okay, thank you, Ben. Thank you, guys. And uh, so, so today, I mean, uh, mainly I will talk about uh, like uh, uh, spatial temporal patterns in the brain, and uh, particularly mm -hmm. I'll focus on uh, uh, spiral wave patterns. Okay, which is related to one of our recent papers and also a theory we we'll, we've we'll been developing, which is called a, a factoring your sampling theory. But anyway, I mean, this is just <laughs> this sort of like. Uh, uh, informal seminar for 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 us, and hopefully this video uh, would uh, facilitate some sort of like collaborations between between us. All right, uh, let's start to look at uh, uh, these local cortical circuits. As we know, for local cortical circuits, right? I mean, we have many excitatory neurons, many hypnotic neurons, and they work together. And we know that um, uh, around eighty percent of neurons are excitatory neurons and the 20% of neurons, they are inhibitor neurons, okay? They work together to have, a, I mean, so-called like balanced state. And uh, within this balanced state, and uh, neurons would fire in a very irregular and uh, random way. So this is uh, just one neuron, uh, the spikes for one neuron. This is uh, the, the stimulus onset time. So this is, I mean, spontaneous of that neuron. You see, this is one spike, another spike. Uh, the interspark intervals are very irregular. Uh, this is one trial, another trial, and we have this within and across trial variability. So after stimulus onset, of course, we can see this sort of like increase of fire rate, but uh, um, uh, the neurons still fire in a very irregular way. So this is quite a uh, uh, long standing, uh, this kind of classical observations. And also it raises very interesting question. So why we have this sort of regular uh, irregularity of variability uh, in the sparking dynamics of neurons, right? So that's something I'll come back later uh, while talking about neuron computational theory uh, we've developed. However, so this is a uh, dynamics of individual neurons, but we have a look at population activity and we'll see all kinds of interesting emerging the spatial temporal patterns. So this is a uh, based on work we've done with uh, one of my ex-PhD student, Rory Townsend, uh, by collaborating with uh, Paul Martin and also uh, Sam Solomon. So this is uh, already recording in the empty area of a marble set. Uh, I mean, so this Utah array, 10 by 10 Utah array, covering four, milli uh, four millimeter by four millimeter, this sort of uh, size of empty area of marble set. And uh, we, we found all kinds of interesting spatial temporal patterns. So here, so this is a vector fields. You can see, um, I mean, activity somehow uh, flow uh, toward a singularity point here. Okay, so this is called a sync pattern. And also we found spiral pattern as well. So this is spiral in uh, to that singularity point. And also we found a saddle pattern. Uh, and uh, this population level of, of neural circuit. And also we, uh, I mean, based on the same data set and we found that, uh, so actually those those waves or those, those patterns, they can encode uh, propagation direction of external similar. So this is based on propagating wave of uh, theta oscillations. We can use the propagating wave of theta oscillations uh, to uh, to I mean to to I mean for this case I mean these waves can can, can represent direction of external stimuli, uh, suggesting that the wave uh, would play some sort of like functional role in at least in the empty area of viral cortex. So I mean for me this is quite interesting. I mean as I said at at the individual neural level we can see this sort of irregularity and this sort of uh, uh, stochastic properties. Um, and and the circuit level, as I've just mentioned, we we we've seen these sort of emerging spatial temporal patterns. So this scenario actually is analogous to the emergence of a vertex or some sort of coherent structures from turbulence. Because in turbulence, we know that individual molecules they behave in a very irregular way. 
However, at the system level, we will see these sort of emergent coherent structures of vortices in turbulence, right? So this is a very famous uh, uh, painting by uh, by Fagot, right? So so you can see this sort of like a vertical uh, spiral like this sort of patterns. So actually, just by drawing this sort of conceptual link between vortices in turbulence and also this sort of special temporal patterns in in your circuit, we developed the uh, turbulence uh, motivated uh, methods for detecting and analyzing spatial temporal patterns in the brain. So uh, by, by applying this uh, 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 turbulence uh, motivated methods, actually recently, uh, indeed, uh, we found uh, vortices or spirals in the brain, of, uh, uh, in the human brain. So here, for, for this study, particularly, we focus on uh, uh, fMR data, okay, slow oscillations, fMR data. So this is slow oscillations within uh, the range from a point a zero one to point one hertz. Okay, as you can see, we have these slow fluctuations of fMR signal, and uh, based on these uh, signals, and then we can extract the phase of these slow oscillations, right? Just like you can use standard like Hilbert transformation, and you can extract phase of these uh, slow oscillations. So as soon as we have phase of those oscillations, and then we can map the phase on this 2D space. So this is flattened cortex of the human brain. So we got this from, uh, I mean, HCP data, right? And uh, so we we can then obtain this uh, uh, phase map. And uh, as you can see, by looking at this phase map, you'll realize there are these sort of like singularity point. So this is one phase singularity. This is another phase singularity. So this is called phase singularity. So we have many phase singularities here. And very interestingly, uh, based on this phase map, and then we can uh, obtain, uh, just like, I mean, based on this turbulence methods I've just mentioned, uh, and then we can obtain uh, phase vector field. So this, you can see this little arrow here. So the uh, the, the magnitude would represent the speed of, the, of that change and the, the, at the direction of the arrow uh, indicating the direction of the movement of, of the phase signal. So here you can see around the singularity point. So this is zoom in of this figure around that singularity point, you'll see this sort of rotational uh, wave pattern, right? So this rotational wave pattern organized around the singularity point. So this is a uh, uh, I mean, uh, sometimes this would be referred to as like vertex or, or spiral wave, but in our paper, we just refer this as uh, a brain spiral, okay? And also in physics literature, so this pattern would be uh, called a topological defect, topological defect. So here, as you can see, uh, uh, we have this uh, uh, spiral pattern here, one spiral pattern, another spiral pattern. And uh, for this is for left hemisphere, uh, on average, we have around like 18 to 20 uh, spirals, okay, for left hemisphere. For, I mean, for right hemisphere, you can see similar number of uh, 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 spirals. So this is a, uh, this is a, uh, uh, this is the based on this phase vector field. Okay, so here, I mean, uh, uh, phase, phase vector field here. And uh, so this is uh, uh, the red color here. Okay, so this is based on, uh, uh, the, so this uh, the red color here it means that this is a, a rotation direction. Uh, this is a, uh, this is for anti-clockwise rotation direction, and the blue color indicates uh, clockwise rotation direction. Okay, and uh, this anti-clockwise direction and the clock clockwise direction for this uh, brain spirals. Uh, so so and uh, so the very uh, interesting fact is that those spirals. They often uh, they are located near the boundaries between different brain areas. Okay, so this is a, a twenty parcellation scheme of uh, of the brain, as you can see. So these dash lines uh, dash lines outline the boundaries between different brain areas, as you can see. So this is this is color which uh, which indicates the density of brain spirals. So here you can see those brain spirals. They tend to uh, to be located around boundaries between different brain areas. Okay, so so that's interesting. I want to let you know. So why those vortices or spirals they located near the boundaries between different areas, right? I mean that's just because of rotation. I mean they can organize the flow of activity from one area to another area. 
And another or, interesting... Which, um, which postulation scheme was that? So this is 22 postulation. From, from, do, you, do you remember which group? So I think this is from that group called Ito. So this is from the uh, Nature Communications paper. Okay. Uh, so yeah, I was just wondering if, if something about the sort of algorithm they use to create the postulation may relate to the same kinds of features you're seeing using your approach. Because there's so many different types of postulations, each of which have you know, very particular constraints imposed on them to allow the clustering to occur. I was just curious. Which... Oh yeah, that's that's the twenty two postulations. I think that paper is uh, reasonably widely cited. It should be. I mean, that that postulation seems to be uh, widely used in the community. Okay. Okay. All right. And another uh, interesting feature of uh, of uh, spirals is that actually, when you look at this, this is uh, uh, the amplitude. Okay. So this is a uh, uh, distance. I mean, the 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 amplitude of 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 of, of of the signal, right? And the amplitude, the normalized amplitude of signal. So this is distance uh, 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 to, to the singularity, phase singularity point. As you can see, as distance increases, the amplitude of this original fMR signal would increase. So this is another uh, hallmark of, of a topological defect or spiral or vertex, right? I mean, you will see this sort of increasing trend of amplitude uh, for the original signal. And uh, so this is just as I said, zoom in Warren, and here I will show you a movie. And so, uh, so this is original face map. So this is a, a face vector field, and we have a, a, a clockwise the clock clockwise uh, vertex. Okay, this one and the anti-clockwise vertex, which is this one. You see, we have many of them, and they move around. Okay, and they uh, interact with each other in a very uh, interesting way. So, uh, so one property of the spiral is of those spiral is that they they rotate. Okay, they rotate around the singularity point. Meanwhile, the center, okay, singularity center itself would propagate across the cortex. So this uh, is really interesting. Okay, uh, uh, I mean, meaning that they have this sort of rich, uh, this kind of propagating dynamics. So here. I mean, because of the rotation, and then we can look at this kind of uh, angular uh, rotational speed. And we found that this angular rotational speed actually is very heterogeneous. So sometimes, okay, they rotate very, uh, very fast way, and sometimes uh, it rotates very slowly. Okay, so this rotation, this kind of motion is very not stationary, very not stationary. Okay, so in the brain, if you want something which is stationary, okay, I, th I would be very surprised. So for this rotational motion, it's very, uh, uh, very not stationary. Um, and also we look at, as I said, because the center itself, the singularity center itself uh, propagates across the cortex. And then uh, we look at the propagating dynamics of the center by calculating very simple matter, which is mean squared displacement. Okay, you have displacement at the square, and then you calculate mean. And uh, as a function of time increment. And you would see mean square displacement would be a power function of the time increment, which is tau, okay? With power function with exponent uh, 1.6, okay? This means that these, uh, these uh, uh, spirals, okay, they would propagate, the, would propagate in a super diffusive way, super diffusive way. If this exponent is one, it means that those spirals, they would propagate in a normal diffusive way, okay, which is Brownian motion. They would just propagate in this local way, okay, that's Brownian motion. However, if this exponent is smaller than one, it means that spirals would propagate in subdiffusive way, subdiffusive way, okay. I will come back to this diffusive process later on by talking about deep learning, okay, some of, some of our recent work about deep learning. And also we found that uh, 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 actually, uh, I mean, so this is a, a circle depth of the, the flattened uh, hemisphere. Uh, we found that, so this, uh, this line is trajectory of, uh, of, of uh, the vertex, okay, propagating trajectory, propagating trajectory of another one. Actually, we found that uh, the propagation of those vortices uh, or spirals are not sensitive to the circle depth of the cortex. So it means that it's not determined, but the topological uh, property of the cortex. 
Okay, it's functional property of, of the brain dynamics. So, uh, so those vortices, I mean, sometimes, okay, uh, uh, they, they would approach each other. Okay, they would interact with each other. So here I can show you uh, one scenario. So this is an anti-clockwise uh, spiral. This is a clockwise spiral. Okay, they propagate and then they uh, approach each other. And after that, you see, after the, uh, this interaction, both of them, they disappear, they disappear. And but very interestingly, because of these interactions, they can shape, they can transiently shape the overall spatial temporal dynamics near that area, okay? So just give you an example. So before collision, before their collision, here you see they, they collided here, okay? Before the collision, you see we have, uh, this is the streamline highlighting the propagating. Uh, so this streamline would highlight the propagation direction of a wave. So here we have this propagating wave, okay? Uh, propagating in this direction. And after collision, you see the propagation direction of the wave would be changed in this direct to this direction to this direction okay so it means that interactions of this uh, of, of 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 these vortices can actually uh, change or shape the overall uh, spatial temporal dynamics of of the cortex so this is a full annihilation it means that when two vortices they interact both of them they would uh, die they would die they would disappear okay and also we found Partial annihilation, it means that PA, partial annihilation, it means that why uh, after collision, one of them uh, would, would, would disappear, okay? Another one would survive. And also repulsive interaction, okay? They interact and then they go in that way, okay? This repulsive interaction. Again, I mean, you can see this, some figures in the supplementary uh, material of, of, of our that figure, of our that paper, okay? Again, for those interactions, again, uh, they can shape spatial temporal dynamics of the of the uh, nearby area of the cortex. And uh, so, interestingly, those in, uh, interactions somehow they can assemble, okay, in a very uh, self-organizing manner. So, in this way, those patterns they can interact in a cascaded cascaded manner. So, here I just give you an example. So, here you have a vortex, okay, clockwise vortex which would uh, collide with anti-clockwise uh, vertex, okay? And this this guy would, I mean, have, we have this kind of repulsive, repulsive interaction, and this guy would keep moving and that to interact with another one. And here and after uh, interaction, so, uh, uh, so, so uh, after interaction, and this would come back and then interact with, with this one again. So in this way, we can have this kind of cascaded interactions, okay, of those vortices, all right? So this is a, about um, which is I mean this scenario is similar to uh, the interactions vortices in turbulence. Okay, and in turbulence, uh, people uh, found that interactions for those uh, uh, vortices can indeed be used to organize the overall complex flow dynamics in turbulence. So here, I mean, we would argue in the brain, uh, the vort brain vortices or brain vo spirals would play similar role and as in as in turbulence. Uh, okay, as in turbulence. And uh, so that's for uh, spontaneous activity. And then we look at the task condition and particularly we look at the language task. Okay, so this is, uh, uh, as you know, so we have this story listening and, and the math listening task. And after listening, we have a uh, uh, answering condition. Okay, we, we look at this language task uh, to see whether uh, those uh, spirals would play some sort of functional role in cognitive processing, in cognitive processing. So one thing, uh, so th this is, I mean, different from spontaneous activity and for task conditions, actually uh, we observed some sort of clustering phenomena, okay? Because, I mean, for, 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 for spontaneous activity, as I've just mentioned, those, I mean, spirals, they move in seemingly random way, okay, a uniform way. And uh, so we, I mean, when you add to averaging or whatsoever, uh, you couldn't see clustering phenomena. But however, for task condition, and if we do try average across, okay, uh, subjects and uh, uh, with respect to the task onset time, uh, we would see this sort of clustering phenomena, okay? So this is for story listening uh, condition. Uh, you see 
uh, spirals, I mean, they tend to uh, occur more often here, okay, in this area. So this is near P PCC. Uh, uh, so this is for uh, anti-clockwise uh, spiral and, and then for math lessening condition, you would see this uh, uh, clockwise spiral here, okay? So it means that, so the, the rotational directions of those spirals are test task sensitive, task sensitive, task sensitive. Uh, so this is for left hemisphere and this is for uh, right hemisphere. And as you can see, so there's a, this sort of like symmetrical property, okay? So this is left, left hemisphere, uh, this is the right uh, hemisphere, you see, uh, this, I mean, they, they located this kind of in this symmetrical way. Of course, the, the rotational direction would be reversed, right? Because you see, you, you get the change and the map, right? And, and uh, in that way, uh, I mean, uh, why there, I mean, this sort of reversed the rotational direction. And, uh, and so this is for story lessening, this is for math lessening. Uh, and uh, and uh, and this is for uh, the right hemisphere, as I said. So based on this, uh, uh, th this is density map of uh, of spirals. And then based on these maps, we can construct a, a contrast map and con con to do contrast map. And then you can see, I mean, yeah, this, uh, around PTC, the contrast between these two conditions, uh, the contrast between these two conditions is, is very clear. And of course, we can do some further statistical analysis, okay, to show so the difference between different uh, uh, conditions is statistically significant. However, you can't see anything like this for the nine model, okay? For the nine model, oh, sorry, I forgot to mention the nine model. So the nine model is uh, uh, is based on this uh, uh, phase randomization, okay? And, uh, uh, but uh, the very important point uh, for the nine model is that it can keep spatial temporal autocorrelation. Meanwhile, we can shuffle uh, the phase coupling structure in space and time. So that's our nine model. So for nine model, you can't see any of this sort of clustering phenomena. And also you can't see any statistical significant uh, this sort of like a, a difference between different uh, conditions. Now, can I just ask a bit more about the null model just to yeah. understand what, what that's doing? So you said it's keeping uh, the phase relationship. Do you mean but between like um, adjacent pairs of um, of points is that is that right or oh so now model we construct now model in this way you know that uh, phase randomization method right vaguely <laughs> yeah vaguely. anyway so that that that's for temporal signal people often do that for temporal signal but here you see because we uh we wanted to look at like this sort of like spatial temporal structures mm. right or patterns yeah. so we do uh 3d Fourier transformation of the original uh these signals right and then yeah. In, uh, in, uh, in frequency domain, in, uh, and then we do this phase, phase randomization, and then we do inverse Fourier transformation, get back to the amplitude domain. And uh, in this way, and uh, so spatial and the temporal autocorrelations would be kept. However, because you've done these phase randomizations, right? So this space at time coupling, phase coupling would be destroyed. That's our now mode. Yeah. Okay. 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 Yeah, but still, I mean, for this sort of non stationary data, so to come up with a very uh, sensitive and, uh, uh, and reliable surrogate data or nine model is still very much ongoing research question, okay? So, and uh, because as I said, uh, uh, motivated by the study in turbulence, we introduced, we applied spatial filtering, right? I mean, focus on specific wavelengths, um, mm -hmm. just like argon mode, okay? So we focus on specific, uh, 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 wavelength after spatial filtering. And also we have ongoing product. We're trying to use uh, deep learning methods to, to detect those or uh, this uh, uh, vortices automatically without doing any filtering process. Cool. Okay. Okay. So, so we are making uh, some good progress along that direction. And uh, without using, of course, for that case, there's no need to use nine model because it's from original signal. Uh, we use a CNN's convolution neural network uh, trying to detect these uh, spatial temporal patterns automatically and reliably. Yeah. Okay. That's okay. interesting. So... Yeah. That's based on these deep learning methods. All right. So this uh, uh, that's for listening task and also for for answering task. You would see uh, this sort of similar uh, similar clustering phenomena uh, phenomena and also uh, for different conditions you will see this sort of like um, uh, different rotational direction. Uh, for 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 those spirals. Okay, so this uh, this is uh, 
the area near IPC, you will see, uh, uh, see this is a clockwise uh, vertex, this is anti-clockwise uh, vertex. Okay, this just give you an example. And uh, uh, similarly, we can construct a contrast map uh, to show the difference between uh, different task conditions. And also we developed a very simple linear classifier and uh, to decode uh, task information based on rotational direction and also the specific location of those vortices. And uh, so this is because here we have four task conditions, listening, answering for, for story and for math. Okay, so this, this is for uh, ch chance level, chance level, and uh, this is for uh, decoding performance based on um, uh, vertex. Okay, so this is for original data. This is a randomly selected another set of data, right? And so this performance is uh, well above the chance level. So this is decoding performance uh, based on amplitude. Okay, a conventional decoding performance, uh, conventional way of uh, doing decoding based on amplitude of uh, AFMR data. So this is for language task and also for working memory. We also found that the rotational direction and the location of those uh, of those spirals are task sensitive. Okay, uh, task sensitive. So this is a, uh, uh, I mean, some these results mean mean that oh, all right. I mean, uh, these spirals they play some sort of cognitive uh, role in in, 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 in in these processes. What? Okay, as I said, because we use the special filtering uh, process and uh, uh, the concern would be all right. So these uh, vortices or spirals could be byproduct of the filtering process. And uh, um, of course we have uh, uh, the result for based on nine model uh, to show spirals uh, are significant, a significant uh, phenomena. And beyond that, we also look at the, uh, the original signals without doing any filtering process. Okay, so this is, Original signals, and uh, of course, we do. We've done this sort of like uh, uh, try average uh, this sort of process, and uh, uh, I mean for original signals without doing any uh, filtering uh, process. I mean again, we can see this robust uh, uh, the spiral waves. Okay, here this is a spiral wave near PPC, uh, near PPC, and then this is for left hemisphere, right hemisphere, and then this is streamline. Okay, showing. Uh, rotation, uh, rotation direction of that spiral. Okay, and uh, so this is for math listening task, and this is for math answering task. Okay, you can see something similar, and uh, this is uh, uh, again. I mean, this is based on phase, right? And when you look at amplitude, okay, amplitude, you see the center. Okay, so this is center of this vertex. So the near the center, the amplitude is very low, which is a hallmark feature of vertex. Okay, so we have that singularity point, and. Uh, so the amplitude would be organized, okay, uh, and uh, rotate, rotate in this manner, okay. So this is original signal without doing any filtering uh, process. And another point I wanted to highlight is that oh, oh, when you look at the, when you have this rotational structure, this rotational patterns, right, and then when you do this conventional, uh, this PCA analysis, and then naturally you would see this sort of like um, uh, rotational manifold, okay, low dimensional rotational manifold. Because in, in neuron science, this uh, rotational, uh, low dimensional manifold actually is very hot topic because people found this sort of rotational manifold, uh, let's say in motor cortex, right? And they, based on neurophysiological recordings, they found that uh, those rotational manifolds would uh, correspond to the, the movement of arm or, 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 or some other, this sort of like motor behavior. Um, so. Uh, in our framework uh, for uh, brain spirals, actually uh, these rotational manifolds, they are generated because, because of this rotational uh, motion uh, of, of spiral wave patterns. Okay, so that's not surprising. And uh, another thing I wanted to say is that, um, as I mentioned in the beginning, so uh, the interactions, the collisions of, those, of these spirals actually can be used to organize the flow of activity. So this is, uh, here I'll just give you an example by tracing, by tracing the vector fields near those, near those spirals, okay? Uh, we can see, I mean, so the, the two scenarios here, okay? We can see two scenarios here. So one scenario, so here, uh, for this case, we have a, 
uh, clockwise spiral, uh, this is anti-clockwise spiral, okay? So when they interact, so you see, I mean, uh, this is a flow, 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 the flow of activities. The flow of, of activity would be uh, guided through their interaction area, okay? So this, you see, somehow the activity will come here and uh, would be attracted and passed, uh, put through, pushed through this interaction area and the flow in that way, okay? It means that when you have uh, uh, spirals with uh, opposite rotation directions, okay? Uh, uh, their interaction would uh, uh, form sort of a, sort of a gate, okay, sort of a gate to guide through the flow of activity. So this is just like a gate. However, when you have interactions of two uh, two spirals with the same rotational directions, so this is anti-clockwise, anti-clockwise rotation direction. So here, uh, there would be the sort of like a wall, okay formed because of this interaction. So this is, if I look at this streamline, okay, this flow, uh, flow this line, you see that activity would come here. And then here, I mean, in the interaction, we will have this kind of like saddle pattern form. The activity you see will somehow uh, be blocked, okay, would be blocked away from this interaction. Okay, so it can't go through this interaction zoo. So this just like, oh, this interaction between these two spirals would form a wall to, to organize the flow of activity patterns. So this is from real data, this is from real data. And uh, uh, because of these interactions, and uh, so um, uh, these vortices, I mean, they would form sort of like a region of coordination. Okay, so this here, this again, this is from real, real data. You see, uh, we have these four vortices here, Okay, two, two here, okay, two uh, 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 clockwise vortices here. You see activity uh, here, you see, because uh, uh, I mean, they, they, this these two vortices, they have the same rotational directions, right? And uh, these two, they have opposite rotational directions uh, because of this two fundamental uh, role I've just mentioned, you see activity would be guided through their interaction zoom, which is this zoom. Okay, so in this way, and uh, they can organize the flow of activity, hopefully the flow of information. So currently, uh, uh, I mean, we have an ongoing project uh, trying to link the flow of this activity to flow of information. So hopefully, Joe, we will use your information theory to do this sort of analysis. Yeah, you got me thinking a lot about it already. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. Yeah. So, so in this way, we can, I mean, to link this flow of, of vector fields with the flow of information. And uh, so this, uh, this, uh, this is uh, quite, 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 quite interesting. Uh, um, all right, so that's based on, this. we have these two fundamental rules and then uh, based on these two fundamental rule, and then we look at the uh, task conditions. Okay, so here's, so this is for math listening and math answering uh, the conditions as I just mentioned at first, we figure out uh, this task, uh, task specific region of coordination. Okay, so here, anyway, just by looking at differences between the vector fields, or phase vector fields, we can highlight this region of uh, coordination. And uh, this region of coordination, okay, this is the term we introduced. Uh, and uh, uh, this region of coordination is consistent with the uh, classification accuracy. Okay, so this is that uh, uh, decoder we used. So they are consistent. and. Uh, uh, interestingly, we found that this, this region of coordination actually is organized by the interactions of those vortices, okay? Those vortices, okay? So here I just give you an example. So this is for math listening task. We have a, a clockwise vortex here, a clockwise vortex here, anti-clockwise uh, anti vortex here, here, okay? You see when you have activity coming from this direction, coming from this direction. Because of that interaction rule I've just introduced, I've just mentioned, the activity has to go through this path, okay, in this direction. So this is from a, a primary auditory cortex up to frontal, from, from parietal area, okay? So this is a bottom-up direction uh, for math listening task. However, for the math answering task, you see, because of the change of the rotational directions of those vortices, uh, the flow direction would be changed. So we, the activity would flow from parietal area to primary auditory cortex, okay? So this is top-down area. So it means that, so this dynamical flow of activity or information 
would be co coordinated by the interactions of those uh, vortices based on uh, the, the, the two elementary rules I've just introduced. And uh, so this is, uh, uh, I mean, uh, so the, uh, we just grab those vortices and put their locations here. As you can see from this figure, so those vortices, they tend to be located near the boundaries between different brain areas. As I said, I mean, this is very unique position, okay? Because they're near the boundary, right? And uh, because of this rotation <laughs> motion, they can organize activity to flow out and flow in uh, different uh, brain areas. So in this way, uh, vortices can uh, somehow, I mean, can work as a controller or coordinator of the overall flow of information activity between different uh, uh, brain regions or areas, so, right? So that's a, that's a point we, we want to make. And also to further uh, highlight that uh, um, the interpretation, our interpretation about the, this interaction-based uh, or vertex interaction-based flow, uh, flow of information, we, we use the phenomen phenomenological model, coupled phase oscillator, so in this coupled phase oscillator, as you can see, uh, um, there are many uh, vortices formed. And, uh, and to demonstrate that the interactions for those vortices uh, can be used to organize the flow of activity. So we just artificially reverse, reverse the rotational directions of, let's say here, two vortices. As you can see, after we did that and the rotational directions of, of, of the overall flow, I mean, near yeah, that area would be changed. So this is again consistent with that uh, um, interaction-based coordination mechanism we just introduced. People just introduced. Of course, this is phenomenological model, and we have ongoing project. So we try to develop this kind of large-scale uh, model, right? And and, and to to capture this. Uh, 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 first, we wanted to figure out the mechanism of how uh, those vortices they are formed. Okay, based on uh, <laughs> realistic large scale uh, neural model and uh, and uh, on the other hand as 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 show in this phenomenological model we wanted to also um, uh, work out uh, i mean this sort of uh, a little bit more on this uh, mechanism of uh, coordination of uh, of of uh, interacting spirals okay so that's something we've been working on as well all right so somehow, I mean, uh, this coordination mechanism or the functional rule of uh, the interacting spirals is consistent uh, with uh, what we've introduced many years ago, right? So this is old paper. If I wrote this paper now, I would write it differently. But anyway, so this is the old paper uh, in, uh, published many years ago. So the idea is that, so you have uh, many localized wave packets, okay? The interactions or particular collisions of those wave packets can be used uh, to implement uh, distributed dynamical computation, okay? So here I just give you one example. So you have, let's say, uh, uh, this, 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 first these two patterns may, may uh, here, let me uh, look at this. So these two patterns may collide, okay? Based on this collision, what computation can be done? And then this pattern will come here to collide with, with another pattern and, and that computation can be done. So it means that, so those vortices, okay? They need to meet at the right time and in the right place, and then computation is done. And then I will go to another area, okay, to collide with another pattern until the pattern reached the motor cortex and that behavior would, would be generated, okay? So this is something we've been working on uh, based on MEG data because FMR doesn't have this special uh, type of resolution, okay? So we're trying to uh, figure this out based on collisions of uh, vortices. All right, so that's the first part of my talk, and then I'll, I'll quickly cover second part of my talk. So, uh, I mean, so one thing, as I mentioned, so these uh, vortices, they rotate in a very non stationary way. Meanwhile, they propagate. As I said, their propagation would follow this anonymous super diffusion, um, uh, uh, this motion, and actually, uh, based on collaboration with Paul, Paul Martin and Solomon, mm -hmm. Uh, we, we look at, so this is array recording, and we uh, for this array recording, uh, we, uh, we can uh, find the uh, gamma bursts, okay, gamma oscillations. But gamma oscillations with the high frequency oscillations in the brain, like gamma, uh, sharp wave ripple, or, 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 or beta, okay, they are all bursts. So this is very interesting. If I look at this 2D space, those gamma bursts, they would be organized 
as localized wave packets. Localized wave packets, uh, these wave packets also would move in this, uh, I mean, I, I, based on the mean square displacement, we know that those localized wave packets would move in this super diffusive way, just like the motion of, of the vertex based on FMR data, right? But this is for gamma, gamma burst. Uh, we do know that and uh, slow uh, FMI uh, fluctuations are related to gamma activity. There are many papers on this topic. But anyway, so this for gamma uh, burst, uh, gamma burst, they organize low class patterns. Okay, you will see they will stay here for a while and then quickly shift to another location and then jump to another location and so on. So this is called super diffusive levy motion. Okay, levy motion. A similar uh, behavior has been found in sharp wave ripples in hippocampus and also uh, there's a recent study, okay, in uh, gamma oscillations, in which region I forgot the exact region of that um, and the, uh, of the recordings they have done. But anyway, so this is uh, related to gamma activity. You can see, I mean, I mean, their paper. I think they use the clustering and the switching. They use this term to describe this sort of uh, super diffuse layer motion. Okay, so they have clustering a phenomena and the gamma burst would uh, shift to another location and so on. Okay, so this is. Uh, uh, mathematically, so this is uh, uh, described as super diffusive, uh, super diffusive layer motion. So the super diffusive layer motion uh, has been widely uh, found in, in nature. Okay, in nature. So here, so when when birds fly searching for food, their flying path would follow this super uh, super diffusive layer motion. Okay, so there are many papers here. Uh, uh, you can check those papers if you are interested in this topic. Just motivated by our experimental observations, particularly our experimental result or observations of gamma burst wave packets, and we developed a theory. Okay, so this is related to the second part of our talk. So this theory is called fractional neural sampling. Okay, fractional in the sense that because this anonymous super levy motion can be described mathematically uh, by fractional order differential equation, okay? It's different from integer uh, calculus. This is fractional uh, differential equation, okay? So that's really uh, cool stuff in mathematics. So uh, we, we, and then, I mean, our idea is that all oh, those wave packets, they do probabilistic computation, okay? They do probabilistic computation. And so I'm going to introduce this theory based on, if you think about David Myers, three level, three levels of understanding, right? Face, face on this, Three levels, right? So the the from computational level, yes, this is a, a the probabilistic computation, and then I'm going to illustrate our theory, this computation theory, based on circuit implementation and also based on algorithm, uh, this sort of implementation as well. Okay, so uh, conventionally, I mean, <clears throat> in this field, I mean, because we know that a lot of behaviors or brain functions can be uh, categorized based on like Bayes inference, probabilistic computation. Think about the work from uh, like uh, Carl Friston, right? So this uh, uh, probabilistic computation is uh, really, I mean, uh, uh, this kind of uh, established idea for understanding uh, brain functions. So uh, one one theory proposed for understanding how uh, how neural circuits, okay, how the brain can can do probabilistic computation is based on. Uh, it's based on this PPC, okay? So this is PPC theory, okay? Probabilistic population coding theory. Uh, so, but for this one, I mean, uh, this this theory, they made it based on uh, like stochastic, like boson-like sparking dynamics, okay? That's why I mentioned this kind of irregularity of uh, sparking dynamics uh, on my first slide. Uh, so this one is that, all right, so you will base, because of this kind of uh, variable spiking dynamics, so probably probabilistic distributions such as Gaussian distributions, uh, their mean and the variance uh, can be encoded by uh, uh, population neural activity. So this is referred to as uh, probabilistic population coding. So another uh, body of work, or another type of theory is based on sampling idea, okay? Just like MCMC MC sampling. So uh, the idea is that, oh, because of this variability of spiking dynamics, so neurons, okay, neural dynamics can sample specific probability, uh, probabilistic distribution. And based on this probabilistic sampling, and then a neural circuits can do probabilistic inference. But so far uh, uh, in the existing work, so we know that the sampling uh, uh, can only be uh, uh, be implemented, uh, implemented based on 
uh, MCMC, okay, Markov chain Monte Carlo. So this sampling is based on uh, the Brownian motion. Okay, in theory, this is based on Brownian motion. Okay, this movement, this movement, a local movement, Brownian motion. So here, uh, to illustrate our factor neural sampling theory, we build a realistic spark neural circuit model. Okay, so distance dependent, balanced excitation inhibition, uh, and a spark frequency adaptation, and heterogeneous synaptic coupling. Okay, so this is crucial element in our network, in our network. I'll come back to this point uh, shortly. For this heterogeneous spark neural circuit model, and, uh, and, uh, and of course, I mean, we can choose, we just choose one parameter. The other parameters are fixed based on the bio, biophysics of, of, of neurons and neural circuits. So we can change the IE ratio. So this, so this is IE ratio, why IE ratio is high. So here we have this X synchronous stage. Okay, it means that we don't have any kinds of patterns there. Okay, all neurons, okay, they are very regular way in an asynchronous way. So this is classical asynchronous stage. But when IE ratio is low, so here it means that when excitation is relatively stronger, uh, you will see, uh, I mean, this is uh, like a global propagating, uh, you, we will have this glo global propagating wave formed, propagating or sweeping through the whole circuit, right? And uh, here you ha have this kind of localized waves propagating in this kind of smooth way. But uh, very interestingly, just near the transition between different states, okay, from an asynchronous stage and this localized wave stage, in this transition stage, you'll see this sort of low class wave packets. Okay, these wave packets, they will move in this kind of crazy and interesting way. So this movement actually can be characterized by that fractional uh, Levy motion. Okay, something I've just mentioned, okay, super diffusive Levy motion. And to get a little bit of theoretical understanding about uh, this, uh, this working regime, which is this sort of like transition state between different cortical states, right? Uh, we developed a theory uh, uh, based on by extending uh, by, by developing a, a no Hermitian random metric theory, and uh, we 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 figure out I mean the heterogeneous uh, synaptic coupling topology. Okay, something I've just mentioned, which is unique to our circuit model. So this heterogeneity can actually extend the critical regime. Okay, in conventional theory, it's just the uh, Singularity, singular point, just one point. For that to reach that critical point, you have to tune your parameter. But in our theory, okay, because of this heterogeneity, it means that critical state now is extended state. There's no point to tune the parameter. You'll get there, okay, in broad parameter regime in a very robust way. But anyway, I think that's somehow beyond uh, a little bit too much, okay, uh, for today's uh, seminar. Anyway, if you are interested in this extended Criticality, I would suggest you to read this paper. And if you have any further questions, feel free to let me know. I mean, because we we, we, uh, we work for the same university, right? We are very close to each other. Okay, anyway, feel free to come to uh, my office to have chat and we may have a coffee chat about this topic. But anyway, I will, I will ignore the mathematical details about our analysis. But anyway, so the idea is that this sort of coupling heterogeneity can uh, facilitate uh, this kind of robust criticality in extended regime, okay? And also we can explain some other experimental phenomena like diverse time scales, because in the real brain, we know that some neurons, they have, they behave uh, in a very diverse way with, uh, with different time scales, okay? And our theory can explain that. So this is a thread called phase diagram. In this phase diagram, you will see this extended criticality regime, okay? And very interestingly, the argon mode in this extended criticality regime is not like smooth argon mode, okay? Like a smooth argon mode in in other uh, linear linear theory, like like Peter's theory, let's say. And in this case, the argon modes are multifractal. So multifractal is really cool stuff, okay? It's multi because for multifractal, uh, this kind of property, you need infinity exponents to describe the scaling behavior of your system, right? And for monofractal, it means that you just have one exponent to describe your scaling behavior. But for multifractal, it means that you need infinity exponents for describing the scaling behavior in your system, okay? So that's why if our theory is right, okay, that's why 
it explains so why. <laughs> I mean, sometimes if you want to find what scaling exponent to describe criticality or whatsoever uh, in your system, okay, that could be challenging, right? So this is multifractal. And so, but anyway, so we uh, uh, we found something similar uh, and this kind of extended criticality uh, with the multifractality argon mode also in deep neural network as well. Because in deep neural network, we found that uh, the coupling weights uh, in deep neural network, particularly for pre-trained deep, deep neural networks, right? The company ways would follow heavy tilt, heavy tilt distribution. Okay, this sort of heterogeneity, as I've just mentioned, for for our spark neural circuit model. Of course, in real brain, company ways may follow log normal distribution or whatsoever. But in theory, if you want to capture the heavy tilt of the company ways, okay, in large network limit, that distribution has to be power low. Right, I mean, based on the general set of limit theory. Okay, that's why we used power law distribution in our theoretical formulation. So we found something similar in, in, in this uh, uh, print trained deep learning network. And also based on this, we developed uh, 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 developed like initialization scheme for deep learning network. Anyway, I'll just quickly mention this. If you are interested in this topic, again, we can arrange meeting to discuss those topics. So let's come back to fractional neural sampling. So for fractional neural sampling, uh, as I said, okay, so so this is your stimulus, and and the stimulus, of course, is encoded based on latent feature, like oh, I mean, like you look at my head, you have, have orientation and the color, so that's features of of, of this object, right? So the task of neural uh, neural uh, of the neural circuit is to base based on this stimulus, so and then the the aim of this probabilistic inference is to infer the features of your stimulus. Okay, based on post, that's a posterior of 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 neural circuits, right? So, so in our framework, so uh, we have the our that realistic neural circuits, and this we can use the center of mass position, which is center of that local wave packet, right? Based on that center, based on that center, and then we can sample sample the posterior of of the of the of the probabilistic after the probabilistic uh, probabilistic computation. So this is center of the pattern. You see the center <coughs> would still move in this super diffusive wave motion way. And then if you look at all the correlation of the trajectory of this uh, of this center, you see you would you have this sort of damping oscillatory component. So this oscillatory component is theta oscillation. So theta oscillation is extremely important in the brain related to many cognitive functions from attention to decision making, working memory. Okay, I will talk about that shortly as well. So this is, we have theta oscillations here in our realistic spark neural circuit model. And so this is a mean squared error and showing this mean squared error. So this is a sample distribution of the two distribution. As you can see, I mean, they, they converge. It means that our network would do a good job in terms of sampling uh, the proper target distribution. Uh, second top target distribution. So that's based on circuit uh, circuit implementation. And then mathematically, as I said, we want to, I mean, if you think about David Myers' three levels of understanding, and then, so mathematically, we formulate this as uh, uh, this, this, uh, this mathematical model, okay? So this is uh, uh, the mathematical model of our fractional neural sampling. So this is a uh, uh, just like a logical like equation, but here we have a, a Levy motion, okay, which is used uh, to describe the Levy motion of the wave package in our in our theory. And here we have momentum term, okay. This momentum term is used uh, to model that damping oscillation, theta oscillation in our spark neural circuit model. And then, so we can solve this mathematical uh, model analytically by using fractional fork plug equation technique. And we can solve that, and to link this target distribution with uh, with the BX, BX is energy or uh, this probabilistic uh, um, uh, landscape, which is just like if you think about this from energy landscape, right? Just like what Mac and Brandon has done, right? If you think about this as from energy landscape for the brain, right? This could be energy landscape, and then uh, based on this, we can send energy landscape, and then we can uh, send our target distribution, and we can solve this analytically, and. Uh, so the, the advantage of our theory is that, all right, so this, uh, our fractional neural sampling can freely and adaptively sample and represent uh, these uh, bimodal distributions with separated modes, 
Okay, so here I just give you an example. So this is two distributions. Okay, just like a reality in the real nature, you have two different objects separate from each other or whatsoever like that. So this is our theory. Alpha is 1.2. So this means that we have levy motion here. Beta is one. It means that we have that momentum damping oscillatory component. I mean, just like theta oscillation here. You see our sampler, okay, can sample this probability distribution for a while and then jump to another uh, the, the another mode, okay, to sample another mode and then jump to another mode and then jump to another mode and so on to sample these two, uh, two modes of this probability distribution. But for conventional theory, so this is conventional theory, okay, based on Brownian motion, you see uh, the sampler would be trapped to that mode without ability for sampling another mode of this probability distribution, okay? So Brad, if you think about this as energy landscape, right? Think about the, the work you've done with Mac. It means that so the the, the sample uh, sampler would be trapped to a low, local minimum of your energy function, okay? Without ability of going to another minimum, right? So and we made prediction based on this mathematical model. So if you increase the mode separation of two, these two distribution, you see the uh, the mean exit time, okay, would uh, uh, increase linearly, okay, but for conventional theory, it would uh, I mean, blows off. It would blow off, right? Exponentially, okay. But also, we uh, uh, we test this. Um, also, we test this in our spark in your circuit models. That indeed the case, okay. So we have this kind of linear uh, property. Um, And uh, sorry, I'm, I think I'm running out of time. Do you guys have like five minutes? I can finish some part, the part about attention. Okay, sorry guys. So, and then we can use this theory to explain uh, zero perceptual uh, inference. Okay, so this is based on that, this experimental work. Okay, our theory can explain that uh, that perceptual inference experiment. Uh, anyway, if you are interested in this topic, you can look at our paper. And now I'll talk about attention as asked about Mac, right? Uh, about, uh, our model about attention. So we then apply this to explain uh, uh, vision attention, particularly for uh, bottom-up attention, driving by the saliency of external inputs. So this is a conventional attractor-based idea about vision attention developed by Ita Akoch. So this is based on, uh, of course, you have some complex or uh, complicated way to form Settings map and based on you and then you add settings map to uh, settings map to uh, to a network. So this network would have a a, a mechanism a winner take all. Okay, a winner is just a tractor, right? So it means that all right, your attention maybe first focus on here. As I said, this is bottom up attention based on settings map. Your first your attention may focus on here, and uh, and then right the point is that I mean your attention can't focus on there. I mean, it can't be there forever, right? You have to shift to some somewhere, some some other places, right? Otherwise, I think you are going to be in big trouble. So to do that, so in conventional framework, so they 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 used inhibition of return, right? They they added inhibition here to kill that attractor, right? So activity would then be removed from that place, and then activity would move to another place. Your attention would put move to another place to sample. Uh, uh, another place. So, but in our case, okay, there's no need to introduce inhibition of return. So we just interpret local wave packet as attention spotlight, attention spotlight. And then first we just look just like in real experiment, we, we, we want to figure out how the attention spotlight will sample uh, this, let's say this two, Two objects, right? So when we add two objects here, because this, I mean, for our circuit, we have a periodic boundary condition. So one near the center, another near the boundary. But we will see that, okay, attention spotlight, which is that wave packed, would stay here for a while, okay, sam sampling this input and the shift to another location for sampling another input uh, in this kind of intermittent uh, fractional levy motion manner. So when you have pattern, uh, when you have a pattern focusing on this object, you will see this sort of bursting, uh, sparking activity behavior. And uh, during this bursting, uh, bursting spikes, you will see gamma burst as well. Okay, gamma burst. And 
you can see this is one burst, another burst, another burst, another burst. We'll have this burst. We'll have this burst occurring around like four times per second. So it means that we'll have the theta oscillation in attentional sampling, in attentional sampling. So this uh, theta, <laughs> Theta uh, sampling is, uh, is a well uh, classical observation about uh, attention sampling, okay? No matter uh, how you think you are smart, right? <laughs> but actually your attention would sample like roughly around like four or eight to eight objects per second, okay? So we are not that kind of smart as we think we are. So because of this fundamental, this kind of, uh, uh, this kind of like, I don't know, limit or advantage depending on how you interpret those oscillations. And also uh, in our model, theta oscillations and gamma oscillations, they are coupled as in, as in real network. Uh, and, uh, and also uh, <laughs> those patterns during this attention uh, sampling process, okay, the pad attention spotlight still moves in this levy flight motion manner, okay, as characterized based on uh, mean squared uh, MSD and also the distribution of the displacement uh, but the one thing I wanted to highlight is that, so uh, this uh, our fractional neural sampling mechanism uh, can address a very interesting uh, question, which is the uh, the trade off between exploitation and exploration during attention sampling. Okay, because of this kind of large fluctuations of uh, fractional motion, so your pattern will stay here for a while and uh, jump to other locations as as well. So in this way, I mean. By focusing on this object, this this given objects, right? That's exploitation. But because of this kind of large spatial temporal fluctuations, so that attention pattern would jump to other locations. In that sense, in that sense, so attention can explore other opportunities as well. So this is long-standing uh, problem of exploitation and exploration. Okay, not only for attention for decision making and also for reinforcement learning as well. So we have a project about applying this to understanding, uh, to understand uh, exploitation and exploration in reinforcement learning. And also this is, I mean, I'll ignore that. Okay, so finally, uh, so this is uh, related to another life research we have been pursuing uh, in, in our group. So we, uh, I mean, as you know, we, we've also been working on deep learning. So this is, we, we, uh, we've, um, we've been uh, uh, working on uh, formulating uh, a, a fractional uh, a transformer, okay, based on our attention uh, mechanism, okay. As you know, transformer is foundational model of uh, ChatGPT, and attention is all you need in that in this first paper about transformer, and uh, so that's why I mean we've been trying to uh, apply our attention mechanism to transformer to formulate a new type of transformer. Anyway, I think I will ignore the rest. Okay, this is related to similar dynamics we found in the learning dynamics in, in deep learning. And I don't think I have time to cover that part. Okay, all right. That's all from me. Feel free to ask questions, guys. Thanks, Pauline. That was an amazing amount of uh, big ideas packed into, packed into one talk. Uh, yeah. big, big adventure for the audience. Um, yeah, really exciting to see all that together. Um, I think we'll, I'll open to uh, questions. Students should always uh, have the preference when it comes to questions, although I have some. Um, so I'd like to see. So if you have a question, I think you can just unmute and ask, or if you want to be polite, put your hand up, or if you're shy or, or uh, otherwise, you can write in the chat and I'll read it. I've definitely yeah, got like questions, that. but I'll wait for the students and postdocs to go. Yeah, I had a, yeah. a question. All right, Josh can push in. Josh, you go, and then Eli. Yeah, um, yeah, I know. That was like a great talk, Paul, and thanks. Um, it's a bit of a while, though, because like it's from the first part. Sorry, I was just like digesting it. But um, with the brain vortexes, because you had like both the rotate um, clockwise and anti-clockwise rotating spirals, when you're showing the examples with like the full partial annihilation and repulsion, you were just showing from like opposites rotating spirals. But I was wondering, like, is there a different pattern if you had two of the same, like if two clockwise rotating spirals interacted versus like opposite rotating spirals? Yeah. 
So for four spirals with the same rotational directions, where they collide, okay, they most likely they would have this repulsive interaction, okay. So because of this repulsive interaction, so there will be a set of pattern formed in the between of their interaction uh, region, okay. So that's why I mean, as I said in the later part of that uh, that part of that of of of, the, of, of that part, so uh, I mean these two. Uh, what is it with the same uh, rotational uh, directions? They would form a sort of wall, blocking activity uh, to flow through that interaction zoom. Yeah. So th I mean, they tend to have these repulsive interactions. Right. Yeah. And then, like, I guess, like, because you're also showing the distributions, like, mostly it's the full and partial annihilation interactions you find. Yeah. Then I guess, like, you, it's quite rare then to find two, like. I guess of the same rotating spirals near each other, you'd usually find at least like a clockwise or anti-clockwise, like in between, they won't just be like a big cluster of spirals spinning the same direction together in one area. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. Because this kind of like interactions be uh, between spirals with the same polarity or rotational direction, okay, that, uh, that uh, probability is low. Uh, much lower as compared with the other interactions. Yeah, you are right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And like, I guess, like, do you, would you have like a reason why you're unlikely to find those um, like similar rotating spirals together? Is... Uh, yeah, because the thing is that I mean, I mean, this is a, I mean, uh, more broadly, this is related to like, uh, you you know, for dynamical systems, you have these kind of flow patterns, right? And uh, uh, you have this kind of topological, uh, this kind of charges, right? Positive charge, negative charge. And in theory, if you have this close, close the system, right? You have many of these kind of charges, post, positive charge, negative charge. And uh, based on this dynamical system theory, and the total amount of charge, if you add them up, okay, the 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 value should be close to should be zero, right? So that's why if you look this <laughs> look at this kind of uh, the, the 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 charge okay as I said spiral or what have spirals what is is that uh, called like topological defects in physics right they have charge positive charge negative charge positive one negative one right when you look at local area right and uh, so because of the, the the that big theory I've just mentioned so you should get uh, something close to zero right so that's why uh, why I mean if you look at a uh, local area I mean the chance to see the vortices with the same uh this kind of rotational directions okay the same rotation direction the chance is relatively uh, lower when, 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 when looking at uh, when, when observing vortices with opposite rotational directions but they they do happen right because this is very non-stationary okay global phenomena but here i'm talking about local this kind of circuit level observation no, no thanks for that Right, Eli next, and then Joe probably. Um, awesome talk, Colin. Thank you. Um, Thank you. It was nice to hear it straight from the horse's mouth, as the saying goes. Um, yeah, I had a couple of, I guess they're more conceptual questions um, related to how you interpret what you're finding. It's similarly related to what Josh was saying, and that often when you were presenting the uh, rotational dynamic stuff, you were spending a lot of time focusing on the singularity locations. I mean, obviously you did the work at the end there where you're looking at fluid flow, but like, why is it that um, you phrase it a lot? Like, oh, the vortices or the singularities are constraining um, dynamics, you know, along this trajectory or, or uh, blocking it from this trajectory when like, we know like from physics literature and fluid mechanics more generally that the vortices themselves are often artifacts of um, structural, like structural underpinnings. So for example, a river flowing um, right hits a rock on the left side, uh, vortex is instantiated on the left and it's that eddy is just because of uh, like a friction force and indeed a, uh, an increase in pressure, like the fluid flow has to increase. So in order to have uh, neural dynamics that are propagating from point A to B, which you actually elucidated in your early 2009 paper, if you've got these wave fronts that are propagating, you have to instantiate, um, well, there, ha there has to be these eddies either side in order to have that localized wave front propagation. So like, why is it that you want to that you, you keep referring to them as a, as, as a constrainer or a shaper of neural activity when in fact, the neural activity itself is the potentially the cause, like it is in other fluid systems, like vortex shedding, you know, fluid flowing past a cylinder. You get these vortices instantiated and they shed off. And like it's the vortex that's really the, the piece of interest, right? It's the structural information. 
that's going on. Um, and the vortices are just like because there was something there and it bounced into it. I was just curious here. Why, why is it that you want to interpret it that way? Oh, yeah. I think that's a very good question because originally we we, we, uh, we thought in a way just like what you just mentioned, right? And about later on, based on our uh, particular for the task uh, uh, conditions, ta task related data, right? And uh, we did see those vortices, the, I mean, their rotational directions uh, and also their locations are very task sensitive. And also uh, their interactions as I illustrated in the later part of the first part, <laughs> first part of my talk. So their uh, interactions can uh, really be used for organizing the flow of, 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 of the activity, right? So yeah, because but, of this- th th yeah. That's the question I have though, like why you want to phrase it the way, like I don't doubt that, that, that these things are, you know, sensitive to task conditions, right? Like if you've got activity flowing from some particular spatial location to another, um, that's constricted in its wavefront, then you're quite likely to get something like these rotational uh, eddies sitting either side of it, such that the, yeah. the wavefront is in fact yeah, propagated yeah. between those two points. But it's not the eddies themselves that are constraining the neural data. The neural data has propagated that way. That you're looking at a really narrow part of the frequency spectrum um, and like there's activity that sort of sits across a little bit more of a broader frequency domain. Yeah, yeah. Therefore, you will, see, you will see, these, see something like, and then like, because it, it's just curious to me, like why you've already your description yeah, yeah, yeah. Like okay that. yeah 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 i know i know your point so so the thing is that i mean uh, for for our case of course i mean by drawing the analogies between uh between 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 our observations and also some theories of uh, uh vortices in turbulence right and so so uh for our this case right i mean i mean this i mean in our case i mean because of the the, the rotation of the vertex it would organize the flow of of activity, right? And uh, so on the other hand, as you just met, okay, the flow of activity may generate vortex, right? So this is about, I mean, so who is organized uh, what, right? But for our case, okay, as I said, um, I mean, because of this kind of decoding, all these kind of things, and also by drawing uh, based on our that phenomenological model, okay? And based on that phenomenological model as well, and, uh, and also by drawing the analogy between our observations and the similar observations made in turbulence, right? And in turbulence, I mean, some theories of turbulence, we know that vortices, uh, they are skeleton, they are organization skeleton for organizing the flow of activity. So they play a little bit higher level role for organizing the overall complex dynamics of turbulence. So because of that phenomenological model and the similar theoretical argument uh, in, in, in turbulence in other fields, okay, we, uh, we, 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 we uh, we, we we proposed this mechanism, but the things that I mean to demonstrate this causal role, okay, causal role of uh, vortices in terms of organizing the flow of, of, uh, of activity. There are many things we need to do. So this is just starting point of this exciting exciting journey, right? Hopefully we can collaborate to work on that. So <laughs> I can tell you, we have an ongoing project and uh, based on collaboration with Food and Colleague. So we use this TMS because there they can do this TMS experiment along with the uh, uh, FMR study, okay, or, or, or some other study. So we're trying to change the rotation direction of those vortices, okay? Based on this change, and then we will see how this will change the flow or, or wave uh, flow of waves surrounding that vortex right and eventually sure. we'll see how this would how this would change the behavior okay we want to figure out that co causal relationship but so this is just a starting point of, of that work based on conceptual link to other fields and also based on our mechanistic model and based on our uh, functional relevance by based on this kind of classifier this kind of readout uh, of uh, information from vertices yeah, cool. And then just a, like a really brief follow-up question. How do you view excitation and inhibition in this um, rotational framework? Like you, you're just looking at fMRI signals, right? You don't know whether or not it's like, like what's the driver of those signals? Like obviously inhibition could be you know viewed as a blocker of acti activity propagating. So how do you view that in this framework? You mean excitation inhibition from neural level? Yes, from a neural level. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, again, I think this is uh, this, uh, the, I mean, I didn't show well from our modeling study. So this is ba uh, based on the paper we published with Adam. So that uh, I think 2016 paper, Journal of Neuroscience paper. So in that paper, uh, we found that actually, uh, <clears throat> while excitation is much stronger than inhibition, you have this stable vertex or spiral wave, very stable. So that vertex, just one big spiral there, so that spiral doesn't have spatial temporal 
non stationary complexity as in the real brain, right? However, so that means that that could be epileptic state or something like that, right? But the, the thing that we found, we didn't point that out. Of course, I mean, that because that was a long time ago. But when excitation and inhibition balanced, you'll see this sort of complex spiral waves formed. Okay, so that's related to your question. I think in the real brain, so this kind of right balance of excitation and inhibition could be the mechanism for the formation or the emergence of the complex spiral waves, as we found. Uh, uh, of course, but this is for the macroscopic fMAR signals, right? So the exact relationship between fMAR signals and neural activity is still, I mean, um, I mean, <laughs> ongoing research topic, right? <laughs> As you know, but at least for me, so that's a, a starting point for me for, for us to develop this kind of large scale whole brain, this kind of like a neural circuit model, okay? And the neural model to illustrate the neurophysiological mechanism of the formation of these complex waves. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. All right, Joe, next. All right. Actually, first thing I want to pick up on, on Eli's question, and I guess this is a question to both Eli and Pulin. Uh, with the analogy about, you know, the rock under the surface of the of the river and getting the vortices, the way I see that is that, you know, we can't see the rock here. All we can do is measure what's happening on the surface of the river and and look at trying to understand the dynamics of how the vortices are interacting with what's around that we can see on the surface of the river. That, that's how I see it. Um, how does that relate to, um, I guess, the question and the answer is, uh, is the first thing I want to ask. Um, yeah. yeah, I'm happy to jump, jump, jump in there. Yeah, I mean, like, I'm not disputing that they're completely useful structures for inferring, like, you know, in the case of the river, the depth of the seabed, of the riverbed and locations mm -hmm. of rocks and, like, upstream and so forth. I mean, it absolutely is the case. Like they tell you about the the structure that the fluid's flowing through. Um, mm -hmm. It's just like the interpretation of it. And in, th in that case, it's the structure itself that's constraining um, and forcing those dynamic objects to be instantiated. Um, like the fluid, you know, in, in the case of an eddy, you often have a river constriction, constriction, and then expansion. And in the expansion zones, you get the eddies that form either side in, in the mm -hmm. expansion zones. But it's the constriction upstream that's caused those eddy formations. Um, in a simple example. Anyway, I'll let Paul an answer. Yeah, I think, I mean, uh, certainly, I mean, there are some sort of like a uh, physical constraints, right? I mean, th th because this the brain is physical brain, right? And so, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and that's why we found, I mean, vortices, they tend to be located near the boundaries between different uh, brain regions, right? And so, uh, so that's, uh, I think that would be, so we framed that, okay, we described that as sort of like a, a type of like structure function relationship. And also from functional aspect, that sort of like, structure and functional relationship has some unique functional advantage because if you are near the boundary between different brain areas, right? Because of rotational direction, you can organize flow of activity between different brain areas. And also, uh, yeah, as compared, I mean, another point I didn't mention as compared with uh, with a pew, like this kind of like traveling wave or plane wave. So rotational wave would have this extra degree of freedom, which is this kind of rotation direction. Okay, so this makes uh, the spirals or, or vortices really cool and really unique in that sense. And uh, yet another point is that um, uh, spirals or vortices, they will have that phase singularity center. So that phase singularity center, because of that phase singularity center, in physics, let's say in optics, people divided optical devices uh, to, uh, to use the phase singularity center to, to to have some sort of very sensitive uh, information processing ability, because that singularity, singularity center is very sensitive, sensitive to external input. Okay, because of that feature, they set up this kind of vertex-based <laughs> optical computing devices. So that's a very big uh, open research topic in optics. Hmm, okay, I, I, I might pick up on that with you with you later on. Um, so I, I didn't really know that aspect. Um, the main thing I wanted to ask, though, uh, was still on on the coherent structures. Uh, you, you know I love the, the coherent structures, so it, it's really nice to see yeah, yeah. where this work's gone, and in particular with um, you know the real fMRI data here. I, I think you know one thing that was fascinating to me is just how clean it looks when you're focusing on that particular frequency and looking at the um, the phases, and then then how they're interacting and seeing the vortices there. Uh, so thanks, thanks really, thanks very much for for showing us that. 
what I want to do is to dig into the relationship between you know, our theoretical view of what's going on in the interactions between those coherent structures and mapping that to what's happening in, in cognition. On the, on the theoretical side, you know, dating back to your work in 2009 and, and all the work on collision-based computing in complex systems before that, you know, we have these views on what's happening with these uh, coherent structures carrying information and their um, interactions and collisions, processing information and, and so on. And now here in this data set, you've been able to start mapping those to what is happening in the cognition, like with the listening to storytelling and the listening to maths and seeing the different kinds of vortices in different areas, mapping to those cognitive tasks. And then the next step from that is that you've uh, been able to look at, you know, specifically where those vortices sit seems to be potentially channeling information uh, between different areas that might relate to top down or bottom up that has a particular cognitive meaning there. The next piece seems to be, uh, to me, about the movements of those, those vortices. So you've done a lot of work characterizing how they move, and uh, in particular, they, they're super diffusive and so on. What I didn't see, and potentially this is where you're taking the work next, is can we ascribe um, cognitive meaning to, to the specifics of where those vortices are, are moving? Uh, my guess is that's, that's an ongoing piece of work. Um, can you tell us anything about that? Yeah, okay. So so here, as I said, okay, those vortices, they, they tend to move in this kind of like not stationary mm. way in terms of uh, rotation and also mm. propagation. So rotation, as you uh, as I demonstrated, you see the angular speed is very <laughs> variable. Mm. And also rotation direction would follow this super uh, anonymous diffusive process, right? And uh, to link... Uh, uh, to link this kind of specific uh, motions of vortices to cognition, okay? Mm -hmm. I think, so the, the, is, I, I don't think uh, it, does, it, makes, it makes a lot of sense to, it doesn't, I don't think it, it makes sense to look at a just one trajectory or something like that, okay? So things just, uh, you get to look at many trajectories happening simultaneously, okay? To see how they coordinate and then to relate that to cognition and uh, to see how meaning or cognitive function can emerge, right? And uh, so these kind of things can emerge because of their, 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 their interactions or, or, or specific motion or interactions or something like that. As I said, so why, why if my hypothesis would be all right, they have to meet at the right spot at the right time, okay? And uh, if they miss each other, okay, because of this, okay, if they miss each other, I mean, you may have latency in your behavior or you may you have an error in your behavior. So that's, um, as I said, we've been working on that beta MEG data based on this sort of uh, uh, interaction based on this general idea. So at the right spot and the right time, right? And uh, for in this sort of framework, so so uh, I, I, I don't think, uh, so the whole, the whole, this kind of package of vertex is important, but what's important is that singularity point. So that's related to, why, when you look at the neural data, neural physiological data, right? People done this kind of low dimensional reduction or manifold analysis, they can project this high dimensional data to low dimensional stuff, okay? That's just because you have coherent structures as, as you just mentioned, right? You have this redundant information. The, the, this kind of like condensed, this kind of information carrier should be this low dimensional, okay? In, in, in the context vertex, it's just that singularity point. I think the trajectory for those points at their interactions. Yeah, so, yeah, that makes sense. Wouldn't you and Joe be interested in the the coherent, like the two zones of that, like the, where coherence is interesting, like where you've got these two uh, opposite ro rotation directions, and you're getting this intersection zone, right, where you're getting large streams of of phase waves combining together to become, you know, in this really constricted fashion, right? That's basically integration. I mean, the rotations around. Um, like it's just some sort of trivial like rotation dynamic, right? Where correlation could be shared at some phase delay, yeah. Um, yeah. but it's fixed, so it's coherent. But then like, it's like really low dimensional, but then actually the intersection zones are where you're combining potentially disparate pieces of information and, ma and making them coherent. So it's like integrating um, information. And then conversely, when you have the two likes rotating and you're getting this destructive zone, you've basically got a part of the system that's um, not communicating with the rest of the system for whatever reason, it's not propagating information. So it's more like a storage state. So you've got mm -hmm. these two like transfer, like the transfer is the opposites, which is what I was describing before when you're getting this constriction in the river, 
And then the latter where you've got the two like states is a kind of storage state where like, I'm not going to pay attention to anyone else. I'm just going to stick to my phase that I have at the moment and not process anything. Um, surely those would be the interesting zones to track. What do you think about that, Paul? And like, I mean, you've talked a lot about the singularities and tracking them, but surely the intersection zones, which you also talked about, um, would be super interesting to track. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so as you said, I think, yeah, yeah, that's a very good point. So interaction rule zone is can be, I mean, re <laughs> That's why I mean, like Joe, like I mean, the, the information dynamics can can may, we we can talk about this later, Joe. So about I mean, how we can apply your interview. In. So one one idea would be applying your information dynamics to to quantitatively demonstrate those um, uh, vector the the flows of vector fields uh, would represent flow of information. Okay, that's what I want to see. And uh, if we have a joint like uh, owners or master or PhD student, that's something we can. Yeah. I really Absolutely. started. Okay, so there's one paper. I can send you a paper. In that paper, they use the, yeah, they use transfer entropy, I think, maybe. And they they, they look at this. I think that's from which group. Anyway, I can send that to you later today mm -hmm. or tomorrow. But anyway, so that's something we want to, uh, we can work on together. Mm -hmm. and, the, and then that's related to what Eli just re, uh, raised. I think Eli uh, the, the raised a very interesting question. So. I mean, interaction zoom between the vortices or singularity points or the trajectories uh, would be important uh, as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you have like two opposite vortices, right? Because of their interaction, and then you have a play wave formed in the between of this interaction. So that that uh, play wave can be interpreted as integration of information, right? I mean, mm -hmm. but that's something we can calculate based on Joe's information dynamics theory mm -hmm. or, 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 or index. And then when you have the uh, two vortices with uh, uh, the same rotational direction, right? uh, as Ilaja said, and then information is blocked, that could be related to like segregation of information. You have mm -hmm. integration, segregation. If you think about yeah. what people made a lot of noise about segregation, integration, and the balance of something like, like this, mm -hmm. but this is all possible, right? But things that mm -hmm. uh, this, uh, I mean, based on our, um, uh, this, uh, we, we have a, uh, we, uh, we we have a paper on high density EEG, which will be submitted very soon. So based on this, uh, uh, the the high temporal resolution data, so these kind of things can happen very quickly, uh, within like uh, uh, one hundred or fifty million seconds, right? So, so 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 I don't I don't know. So this integration segregation, okay, these kind of things. Um, I mean, how we can uh, um, relate this kind of very rapid this kind of uh, interacting dynamics to that sort of framework. Uh, mm -hmm. And also that's related to maybe Joe. I mean, that's a question for you as well, maybe. Yeah. Um, yeah, use your information dynamics, particularly for this kind of transient, this kind of rapid changing, this sort of flow, uh, mm -hmm. vector flow, right? And the, but we can talk about this later. Yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll definitely do that. I think there's, there's a lot of potential things we can look at here. And, and some of those things will hopefully align um, you know, those hypotheses that, that you and Eli just suggested in the last couple of minutes. And I think we'll see some very new things that we might not expect as well. Yeah, yeah, um, sure. Yeah. Look, I've got some more questions, but Ben, why don't we reopen the floor to any, any students or postdocs before I keep going? Yeah, we're getting to time. So if people need to go on, are you are you free now pull in for more questions or did you have yeah, to yeah, wrap up? At yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm free this morning. Yeah, I think I'm because, uh, as I said, we, we, we somehow we are, I mean, I'm happy to to talk more, and as hopefully, and as I said, right, to facilitate some sort of like collaborations between you guys. I can ask a question on the trajectories and while well, we're talking about them with the trajectories you saw in the fMRI plots, Pullen. What were the um? You had the MSD displacement. What was the uh the velocities of them? Like of the the patterns moving uh, as they were that was that like related to a time scale that would make sense for the tasks or did they change between the different tasks? Uh, you mean the propagation speed? Mm. Yeah, propagation speed. Uh, I think it's around like how much I, I forgot the exact value. But anyway, so propagation. We look at distribution of propagation the speed. Okay, this uh, propagation speed it has heavy tail distribution. It means that uh, sometimes they propagate very slowly. And sometimes they would propagate it very quickly, very rapidly. Yeah, and the very variable as well. So when you look at our that paper, you will see the distribution of propagation speeds would follow sort of like, I mean, very heavy tail distribution, indicating that they are very variable. They are very variable. So, 
And uh, uh, so this is based on collaboration with uh, with uh, Fudan uh, collaborators. And uh, we found that the propagation speed of those waves would have a sort of like gradient phenomena, right? You know the gradient, yeah, 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 yeah. So if you move up along the cortical gradient, you know this gradient, uh, this, 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 right? Uh, based on functional connectivity, you can, uh, you can find the gradient. So the, the I mean, uh, I mean, uh, a student I'm supervising, I mean, a Fudan student, they found this propagation speed would have this kind of gradient phenomena, right? If you mm -hmm. move- Would it be faster up, or lower? Uh, lower, 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 lower. So, so slower speed in lower cortical or faster yeah, speed? Yeah, yeah, the, the slower speed for the higher order cortex. Slower speed, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so that that's the thing that could be aligned with uh, these time scales of, uh, of, uh, of, of cortex dynamics, right? And people found if you move up along cortical hierarchy, the time scale of the, would the increase, right? But decrease, uh, increase, increase, yes. Increase, increase, yeah, increase, increase yeah. Slow but this is yeah, about yeah. propagation speed. Okay, cool. That's interesting. Joe, do you want to, if you've got any more or anyone else? Uh, has Ben ran off? I don't know if Ben's still here. I do, but does anyone else want to jump in first? Yeah. Uh, I w wanted to tell Paul in as well. I don't know if you, do you know next time it's work Paul in, like in the mouse um, calcium recording space? Do you know much about that literature? Oh uh, yeah, we have a paper published with Thomas Nopfield and uh, uh, okay. Thomas Nopfield. Uh, yeah. In, anyway, just a side point. I I went and uh, met next time it's in person at University of Washington, and he showed me some of his mice data. And he was he just been reading your paper and was really enamored by it. Anyway, we chatted a bunch about this paper, and he showed me some mouse data. We had wide field calcium recordings in the mice, and at the same time they had a neural pixel probe jammed into their thalamus, so he had spike recordings from the thalamus. And they basically find this um, spiral wave pattern in the wide field calcium, and it sits at like a modality integration zone. I can't remember exactly where. Um, shows how bad of a neuroscientist I am, or certainly a neurobiologist. But um, anyway, it was in an important zone. And then they were showed that it was yoked to the spiking statistics of the thalamus, which was really nice. Um, I'm sure you'll see that preprint come out pretty soon because I think it, the story was pretty baked. But he was certainly you know, keen, and maybe we can try and f foster some type of collaboration because that data would be pretty awesome. Um, yeah, get yeah, hand, yeah, get our hands on. Yeah, that's great. You may contact him, and and uh, I mean, I'm happy to collaborate with you guys. I think I mean because, yeah. So now, now I mean, yeah, yeah. I think that's yeah, uh, yeah. That that would be very beautiful data set. Yeah, you can we can look at the interactions between subcortical areas and cortical area, and also uh, to relate this to spikes. Yeah. So they did find uh, spirals, right? How, how many spirals yeah. did they find? No, they just found. I think there was just one. Sp one spiral, but it sat at like a at, a at a border as well. I don't know what algorithm they were using to track the phase. I think they just done something pretty vanilla, like similar to what you've done here, right? They just do like Hilbert transforms and do the phase tracking, and they just found this pinwheel that just keep turning up in in the same location. Um, yeah. Anyway, yeah, that's cool. Yeah, please follow the, follow this up. Yeah, um, we can collaborate with this guy. Yeah. You mentioned before, Paul, in, in an email that you thought there might be a link between the arousal system and some of these different measures that you, you're working on. Um, and did, did you want to double click on that a little bit? You know, we think oh. we've been thinking a lot about the cholinergic system and the neurogenergic system, but curious to hear your thoughts. Oh, yes, yes. So this is related to uh, uh, our that fractal neuron sampling theory. So so the thing is that uh, because for that one, we, we applied that uh, fractal neuron sampling theory to look at this uh, uh, bottom up. Uh, attention, right? Driving by uh, settings of external input. And uh, later we extended that to interactions between different cortical areas, right? So we build, build models with uh, like two layers. Uh, so one layer could be uh, V4, another layer could be FEF. And then for this case, we wanted to figure out how different cortical areas, they interact, particularly from the perspective of bottom up, top down. And then and, and and then because in each layer you have this kind of wave pack is localized wave pack is moving in this crazy and interesting dynamical way, and uh, but for real task right, I mean if I give you input your pan pattern should somehow focus on somewhere or stay around somewhere for longer period of time before moving to some other places. Okay, to do that so we use the uh, uh, sort of like a neural modulator uh, motivated mechanism so. To do that, in our model, we just reduce adaptation of some neurons, okay? Because of the reduction of adaptation. And then you know that, I mean, 
some neural modulators, they can, I mean, there are some experimental observ uh, observation. And also there's a review paper by, by Zhuang Duka, right? So in that paper, they, they suggested Zhuang Duka from Cambridge University. So they suggested neural modulators can, uh, can affect attention, okay, because of, uh, uh, and, and there are some other papers showing uh, neural modulators can reduce adaptation. So by combining these kind of different experimental uh, results or observations and the neural model, uh, we can freeze those, I mean, complex dynamics of a wave packets for a while, for a short period of time. So this time, time scales should be related to like behavior time scale around like 50, 60 milliseconds or on your task, okay, before it jumps to other locations. So this is related to, I think related to your, your interest about uh, some yep. like, uh, yeah, neural modulator. Okay, I started your paper, you have that manuscript, oh. <laughs> manuscript, but That's anyway, yeah. So, so, so no, we've been, uh, we've been thinking a little bit about modulating adaptation currents in some of the models. We have a Wilson Cowan like model that we've been using just to kind of demonstrate some of the mechanisms we think are at play in, you know, just really simple toy models, just so that the reader can kind of get the intuition for what we think is happening more globally. But we we also try to kind of push on the biophysical physical ex, uh, explanation as well and think about different types of ion channels, different types of release of different neurochemicals, things like, uh, you know, calcium release inside of cells and the impact that would have on firing rate and adaptation. And that space is, uh, yeah, quite complex. So we we often find that the we have this tension between the implementation level details that we think are really important and the kind of mathematical abstraction that we can use to understand them. And I feel like that space needs a lot of refinement. I think there's work, you know, it, it's it's doable. It's just going to be um, difficult work to do that properly in a way that the biologists will then kind of understand the import of the mathematics of the kind that you've you've been talking about today. So I think there's a lot of work to be done here to kind of get those links together, but we're, we're definitely curious to talk more about it for sure. Yeah, sure, sure, certainly, certainly. And also, are you aware of this uh, releasing dynamics of neural trans uh, of uh, neural modulators? So this, uh, I mean, what's the what was the? Oh, sorry, I missed the I missed the question. Excuse like me. releasing dynamics of neural transmitters. Uh, you uh, mean, new neural modulators. It's very dynamic. The rapid. Oh yeah, rapid yeah, yeah, it's process, incredibly. Right? Yeah, and there's there's also these really fascinating and under under understudied features of neurons, in particular neuromodulatory neurons called silent synapses, where uh, the idea is that if people haven't come across this, um, if you, you forget to think about this sometimes, but neurotransmitters are a finite resource and they're a package in the vesicle sitting inside of, of axons. And an action potential will come along, cause them to release the vesicle, right? It'll fuse, you release the neurochemical. And then you'll often have situations where you try to resorb the chemical and pull it back into a cell. You can, so you can use it again, or you can, you know, uh, have a, um, a different downstream pathway that then kind of figures out, okay, we've got to start making more of that neurochemical or something like that and catalyze a reaction. But all of that takes time. And so you, you, there's actually a really um, sort of diminishing probability that an action potential will or actually cause a cell to release a packet of neuromodulatory chemical with some probability. It can kind of like diminish an asymptote to the point where you could have the action potential coming in and it's almost like firing a gun where you've already fired all your bullets. You just hear the click. And this happens apparently more frequently than we realize in the nervous system. And it's quite troubling for people that want to make the entire nervous system just about a neuron passing a message to another neuron, because that's inherently probabilistic in a really, really important way. And so it's it's an interesting feature. And I think, you know, whenever I hear things like your question, Paul, and I think of these challenging details yeah, of a, yeah, a yeah. biological indeed. system. Yeah. yeah. Indeed, indeed, yeah. But yeah, we haven't thought about that in a great amount of detail. Um, important to definitely think about it. And mm -hmm. my guess is the different kinds of pharmacological agents that we use to modulate this system, things that mm -hmm. block the reuptake of different neurochemicals will have yeah. a big impact on these kinds of dynamics of the actual release probability and the kind of likelihood that a chemical gets, um, you know, submitted to the, to the pool. So, you know, these are, you know, this is definitely in the ca that category of like very hard work to be done, but you, you'd imagine that there would be mathematical relationships here that could be explicable in the kinds of um, tools and techniques that you've been working on. So mm -hmm. I think it's a good time to be asking these questions. Mm -hmm. You're muted, Benny.
Any final questions for Phil? I'm going to take mine offline to talk about with Pilan later. I've talked enough. Uh, Pilan, I definitely want to follow up and uh, and get a, an honours or master's student to uh, to work on some of that data. So we'll, we'll talk offline about that. Yeah, yeah, great. Yeah, yeah, certainly, certainly. Okay, as I said, I mean, we can see this kind of very clean, this kind of uh, patterns. That's right, because mm -hmm. we have a, we use the spatial filtering, but still spatial filtering is very necessary uh, in this sort of analysis. And also, I mean, just like uh, the detection of spirals in uh, in turbulence, okay, you have to look at this kind of uh, uh, different spatial scales, right? And uh, But we do have an ongoing project uh, of applying CNNs for detecting these patterns in a very reliable and automatic way. Mm. Yeah, but we can look at this information dynamics, as I said, to link information dynamics to yeah. uh, to this uh, vector fields to see whether <laughs> vector fields that do represent yeah. the flow of uh, the information. That's something I'm really <laughs> interested in. Yeah, sounds good. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks very much, Paulin. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Thank guys. You. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Cheers.